Uh, so for those of you who are contemplating your first communion, which is coming up in, in really just almost a matter of weeks now, uh, I'd like to ask, how many of you, and let me see a show of hands here, how many of you are planning to take the bread and the wine both, assuming that that's going to be permitted by then, again, because of swine flu? All right, just two hands. How many, oh, oh, all right, more. How many of you are going to take just the bread? One or two. Okay, how many of you are going to, oh, still afraid of germs. Huh? How many of you are going to take just the wine? Okay, I, I didn't see a whole lot of hands. Well, I do have an announcement. Everyone who raised your hand, you're a heretic. It's not bread, it's not wine, and you don't take it like, it's mine! You receive it. You're the passive recipient of a gift. Uh, and I bring this, no, normally I bring this up during our retreat the week beforehand, but this time we're talking about the Eucharist and I'm doing it, so I went ahead and got it in early. Uh, and and this, is not, this is not just idle words. Uh, you know about political correctness. It's hard to... To, uh, to dodge this political correctness bullet that's been around for 20 or 30 years now. Uh, political correctness got started on America's college campuses. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, political correctness did not get started in the political science departments. It got started in the English departments, uh, the departments that are very interested in use of words. And the idea behind political correctness is very simple. The way you use words will affect the way you think about reality, uh, plain and simple. And, and I set a trap for you. Uh, and it's one that I was pretty much expecting you would fall into because people do it all the time. And yet, uh, the fact of the Eucharist and the Catholic understanding uh, is that it is not bread, it is not wine. Looks like bread, tastes like bread, fills up like bread. Looks like wine, tastes like wine, smells like wine, even gets you drunk like wine. But it ain't bread, and it ain't wine. Just looks like it. Uh, this is a, a hugely important difference from the Protestant and Anglican understandings uh, of the Eucharist. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why uh, Catholic, only Catholics uh, in a state of grace may receive the Eucharist. And we'll talk more about that later. But, but there can be conf some confusion there because the, the Catholic sacrament and the Protestant version of it uh, outwardly look the same. Uh, and, and that does lead to confusion. No, they don't outwardly look the same. Have you ever been over here to St. Paul's? Well, Protestant, you include a lot of people. I mean, Baptist Jews, so the crackers and grape juice, they don't look the same. Well, they do at St. Paul's. I assure you that they, yeah, they are, they're identical. Paul's, yeah, they're identical. So, thank you. So, and, and it is, and bread is still bread, so, uh, and that's what we have. We have unleavened bread, that's what we start with, and that's not what we end up with. So, uh, I'm going to look a little bit about the history of this idea of the Eucharist. I'm going to look at the doctrine and how it fits in, why this is a big difference, uh, and then some of the things that result from that. At least that's the idea. As I say, it's going to be a little disjointed and freewheeling tonight. Um, a lot of Protestants uh, start with the idea that the real presence, as it is called, or sometimes transubstantiation, is one of these things that Catholics made up, that uh, Catholics make up things, that they add things to Scripture, and Scripture itself tells us that we're not supposed to do that, and that you don't see uh, transubstantiation set forth until possibly as late as the Council of Trent in the 1500s, uh, or maybe a little bit earlier than that, uh, Florence or Orange perhaps in the 1200s. And in doing that, once again, they, they misunderstand uh, the idea of the magisterium and of Catholic doctrine. I'm sure that I have given this example before. If not, I have to give it. If I have, it's worth repeating. Did Sir Isaac Newton invent the law of gravity? No. What did he do? Discovered. He discovered it. Uh, well, did he even really discover it? I, I mean, surely if you'd lived before Newton, you knew not to go running off a cliff. And people, yeah, people even knew about it, but Newton looked at it and he described it in an analytical, clear way for the first time. 
it had always existed, at least all the way back to the Big Bang. Uh, but Newton was the one who formally set forth something that always was. So when the church sets forth in, in a papal statement, in a conciliar doc, document, uh, in some form like that, uh, something doctrinal, in the Catholic understanding, they're not making something up. Uh, they're not passing a law like saying, okay, now the speed limit's going to be 65 even though it wasn't before. Instead, it's saying this is what is true, what has always been true. It's part of the deposit of faith. We're just clarifying it. We're just setting it forth. And the reason that we're setting it forth only now, explicitly, 1,200, 1,500 years after uh, the death and resurrection of Christ is because nobody has really strongly, formally challenged it before now. Uh, now, there had been challenges, but the challenges by that point had become strong and vociferous uh, in various uh, heretical sects or even dissenters within the church had been speaking this. And so at that point, the, the church has to speak out with clarity in order to, to clarify any confusion that might lead people astray from the truth. Uh, it's something that the American and English judicial systems do all the time through the common law system of, of clarifying and setting forth what has been there all along. And the only reason we're doing it now is because it's at this point that the conflict has arisen. So, uh, so that's important. Another criticism of the Catholic understanding of the real presence or the Eucharist is, uh, is this idea that somehow at some point, and, and the usual point given is probably in the 300s uh, when Constantine became emperor and, and issued the, uh, uh, the Edict of Milan that made Christianity, Christianity an acceptable religion and then later on uh, Christianity became the official religion. Uh, and a whole bunch of perhaps lukewarm or nominal people became Christians because it was fashionable. Uh, the idea is that this influx of, of, of people who are not really Christian, but they're going through the motions, somehow brought in a bunch of pagan practices into the church and corrupted it and messed it up. So, for instance, you had a lot of pagans running around uh, involved in goddess worship and especially the worship of Isis and then all of a sudden they find the Virgin Mary so they make a goddess out of her and so therefore Mariolatry as it is sometimes called is actually a pagan cult. Well that's it's very interesting idea it's uh, certainly not a right idea because if you look at all of the the big items that uh, especially uh, strong uh, fundamentalist evangelicals criticize the Catholic Church for, you can find a good basis for all of those doctrines in the writings of the earliest church fathers within the first couple of hundred years after the life of Christ. Uh, so all of these things that they blame on Constantine and the Edict of Milan actually existed in the earliest stages of the church. Uh, and the Eucharist is no different from those. So to begin with, let's look at the handout, that, uh, the big one that says fish eaters up at the top. And we're not going to read all of these documents, but, uh, but here are just some of them. St. Ignatius of Antioch, St. Justin Martyr. St. Justin Martyr is uh, one of the earliest ones, and his first apology, uh, sometime you need to read or read excerpts from it, uh, because Justin Martyr is doing something very interesting. Uh, by this time, there are a good many rumors out there that Christians are subversives uh, of, of the, I'm not sure they use the word the political order or the state, but that they're subversive of, of the Roman Empire and, and the culture of the Roman Empire because they won't worship the emperor, they won't conform, they won't fall into line with society. And there are even more rumors going around, for instance, they uh, they commit human sacrifice and cannibalism, which of course is a distorted understanding of the Eucharist, uh, and, and all sorts of other things going on around there. So Justin Martyr is one of the first apologists, and apologia in the Greek, it doesn't mean I'm sorry, it was, it was my fault, I hope you'll forgive me. An apology or, or an apologia means a reasoned defense of a particular viewpoint or a reasoned argument in defense of a position. And so that's what 
uh, what the title of this means, his first apology. He is, it's one of the earlier examples of, of a Christian explaining to a non-Christian audience exactly what Christianity is about. And one of the things that he talks about is the Mass. Uh, and I think this is like chapter 65 or 66 uh, that we have excerpted here. Let me see exactly how far we get. Yeah, if you want the earliest description of a Mass, or one of the earliest descriptions of a Mass that we have, uh, it's in Justin Martyr's first apology. And the basics are all there. The Old Testament readings, the, New, well, the, the reading of Scripture, uh, the prayers or intercessions, uh, uh, the Eucharistic prayer, uh, and then receiving of communion, uh, and, and the sharing of bread and wine, which Justin Martyr points out in this passage, uh, we do not see as common bread and wine. Uh, so uh, you can see this echoed in a lot of other passages throughout the 100s, uh, the 200s. Uh, let me see. I, I was putting together one of these for you, and I was, as I was putting together one of my own, I stumbled across this one, which was a great time saver. So I'm not sure it's got all the things I want there on it. But I think you'll find that that this idea of the real presence, that the bread and wine are not bread and wine anymore, you will find in the statements of people such as St. Ignatius of Antioch, uh, Clement of Alexandria, I don't know if he's on here, uh, Origen is a big one. So, uh, so this idea of the real presence goes back to, to really the very beginning of the church. So it's certainly not an innovation. And it, it starts to show you that this idea of the bread and wine being merely symbolic, and, and my view is it is symbolic, but it is symbolic plus. Uh, but the idea of it being merely symbolic uh, is, that's the innovation. That's new. Uh, that is probably uh, not much more than a thousand years old. So. Uh, so that's an, interesting, uh, that's an interesting thought to begin with. Well, what about this idea of, well, that's still just a bunch of Catholic tradition. That's a bunch of traditions of men. Uh, can't find any, anything anywhere in Scripture in support of this. Well, <laughs> uh, I could probably, if I were a real Scripture scholar, fill this whole board up with, uh, with scriptural references uh, to the real presence, or that can be reasonably interpreted to be references to the real presence. Don't have time to do it. Can you all see it over there? So let's just step through this uh, a little bit. Um, I'm going to jump to John 6 to begin with, um, and we've talked about this at some point a little bit, I think, possibly. Um, uh, and what's going on in John 6 is... Uh, is when Jesus is telling him, telling his listeners that that he is the bread of heaven. Um, uh, Fifty-one, uh, forty-eight. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give you for the life of the world is my flesh. Now, before I go on from there, cannibalism in the Levitical law, you know, that's just, I mean, that's a big, horrible, bad, evil no-no. All right? So keep that in mind as as we consider the possibility that Christ may be speaking in metaphor here. Because he does speak in metaphor. Uh, I, I've once heard uh, Father Eric Filmer, uh, who was here a few years ago and a wonderful priest, once say that Jesus only referred to himself as divine in one place in Scripture. Do you know where that is? And he said, I am divine and you are the branches. No, so, yeah, he uses metaphor. He's not a vine. He is true God and true man, not true God and true plant. So yes, Jesus speaks in hyperbole. He uses metaphor. Uh, he, 
he uses many figures of speech. So, so perhaps one objection here is that this is once again just a figure of speech. Uh, that uh, I'm going to give you uh, my body and blood, you know, and, and, and so on and so forth. Well, that's a really jarring, horrific metaphor for him to use. So it, it, it doesn't seem like he would use that as a metaphor to begin with. And now let's look at the reaction. Uh, the Jews, by which we meant, uh, John means his listeners. I mean, there may have been a few pagans or Roman centurions mixed in there. But they disputed among themselves because, you know, they are in this sort of jaw-dropping state, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus elaborates, very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, very graphic, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day, for my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. And I'll go on from there in a few minutes. So he has, he has reiterated this. Now, a couple of interesting points here. Uh, the, the Greek words that we get for eating and drinking, uh, the word eating, and, and I'm, I'm ripping off Scott Hahn for some of this. I, I shamelessly admit, and I don't think he'd mind if I, I did this. When Scott Hahn first came across this passage, uh, having overlooked it deliberately for many years uh, because it was uncomfortable to him as a Presbyterian minister, when Scott Hahn looked at it, he thought, oh, well, obviously this must be metaphor, and I bet he's using a real softball word for eat. So he looks it up in the original Greek, expecting to find some sort of softball word. What he finds is a very graphic, hardcore word. Uh, so the word in Greek here, when Jesus says eat, the word that he, he is using is gnaws, chews on. I mean, <laughs> I mean you know, it's, it's one of the most graphic possible words for eating. It sure doesn't sound like metaphor. Uh, it sounds really cannibalistic. So at this point, his audience is just going, Ey! Now, at this point, if his audience, usually his 12 dim-witted, dense disciples, have failed to understand the parable or failed to get the metaphor, Jesus, and you can all, there's no stage direction in the Bible. You know the only thing wrong with Shakespeare and the Bible? Very few stage directions. Uh, it, it really helps if you've got some stage direction. But Jesus you know, gives this metaphor. Uh, I don't know about what, about the seeds falling on rocky ground or mustard seeds or, or whatever. And usually when the disciples go, uh, uh huh, what, what do you mean by, what do you mean you're a plant? You, you can see Jesus sort of going, let me try this again. <laughs> and then he puts it to them in plain English. Those seeds that fell among thorns were, you know, they had a lot of enthusiasm at first, but then the cares of the world got them and choked the life out of them. Do you get me now? Good. So, uh, Jesus doesn't do that here. When they're going like that, he doesn't say, let me put this another way. Uh, this is a spiritual union of you and me. That This is a symbolic thing. He doesn't say that. He doesn't back off of it. He has given a jarring graphic to the Orthodox Levitical Jewish community offensive uh, metaphor, if that's what it is, but he doesn't back off of it at the end. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, uh, does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered them, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. All right, so if Jesus all of a sudden sees a considerable number of his followers saying, man, I can't handle the truth, and they turn and run in the face of this apparent cannibalism, because he hasn't fully explained everything yet, uh, 
you know, things become clear in retrospect, but some of them can't handle what they you know, seem to be handle. They turn and run. What does Jesus not do? Hey, wait, come back, guys. Figure of speech, really? Vine, branches, you know, really? No. He doesn't do that. You know, he's given every opportunity, and he doesn't do that. And I think this is a very important word in this passage right here. They were disciples. Mm -hmm. They were not just the average peripheral, casual listener. Good People point. I had, not, I had not picked up on that. They yes. They just could not handle the truth. Yes. These, these were not, I, hadn't, I had not really dwelt on that before. I had not really thought about that, but it's an excellent point. These are not the casual, let's go hear this rabbi and see what he has to say. They had apparently been with him and been exposed to his teaching and accepted it and approved it. Uh, and he let them go. You know, they couldn't handle the truth. Um, and and you, see, you see Peter here proceeding, and, and presumably the rest of the twelve, proceeding here on, on blind faith. You know, there are... You know, I mean, we don't like this. We don't understand it. We're not following it. But based on your authority, we'll accept it. Uh, and, and that's what it boils down to. I mean, it's, it's faith. It really is. And don't we see that continuing today uh, on this very point about presence? Yes, and, and, and that's important because, look, we can take a consecrated host and we can submit it to analysis by, by crystallography or electron microscope, and it will have the molecular structure of bread. You know, there is no scientific test that we can do on this. Uh, it, you know, it is a matter of faith. And, and that is confu it was confusing to me growing up because the, the philosophical or theological term you use, and you'll see this, this term in other, uh, in other situations, that the substance of the bread and wine changes into the body and blood of Christ. And when I think substance, I'm thinking chemistry class. Uh, I'm thinking matter. Uh, and, and therefore, if the substance changes, then how come an electron microscope tells us it's still bread? Uh, probably in modern philosophical terms, the, the better word would be the essence of the bread and wine changes into the body and blood of Christ, what it really is. Uh, as opposed to what Thomas Aquinas would refer to as the accidents or the, the outer appearances. Uh, so, uh, so the essence, the deepest reality of it. And it helps us if we get into to St. Augustine, uh, St. Augustine, gosh, St. Augustine and uh, Augustinian theology and, and the ideas of Plato that St. Augustine found useful and beneficial uh, and compatible with the ideas of Christianity. Uh, that, as Obi-Wan Kenobi might say, uh, your senses can mislead you. Don't trust them. Uh, what is the most real? What is the most true? Uh, it is something that lies beyond your senses. Uh, so, uh, so that's something to keep in mind uh, as, as we understand this. And you may be able to, to, to comprehend a bit better the, the idea of the Eucharist and the essence of the Eucharist becoming the actual body and blood of Christ. All right, deep breath here. Yes, ma'am. There's a really good book that I could highly recommend. It's not readily available in most bookstores because it's a Catholic book. It's put out by TAN, which is one of the real good Catholic publishers. Mm -hmm. And it's called The Miracles of the Eucharist, and it's written by Joan Cruz. And it mostly details and chronicles miracles of the Eucharist from ages ago. But there are pictures and documentation of miracles of the Eucharist. And there's a hmm. recent one, um, and I would say recent 20 years, it's when John Paul was um, Pope, where um, some consecrated host was stolen and taken down the street and put in a poor box of another church where dirty money was put in the box. It was soiled. And when they located it, the way you discard a consecrated host is you store it until it goes stale. And that's when Jesus has left the host. This has never gone stale. And John Paul declared that a miracle. Hmm. <coughs> and for the, for the tape, what's the name of the book again? The Miracles of the Eucharist. The Miracles of the Eucharist the by Tan Publishing. The author is Joan Cruz. Joan Cruz, C-R-U-Z.
yeah, okay. So um, I had not heard that about when the Eucharist goes stale. Well, that's what it's uh, written in there. That's where I got it. Okay. Uh, I'd, yeah, I'll, I'll query that when, and, and look when into the it. Blood, so. when the, um, I'm sorry, when the um, bread goes stale, that means Jesus is left the most. Okay. Well, we'll look into that. Yeah, I'll check into that. Never heard that. So, okay. Um, other thoughts, questions, comments? Uh, there is a bit of a question mark in the same passage before we leave it, um, uh, and I'm not even sure I can find it, but at the tag end of this, uh, Jesus says, the flesh availeth nothing. And uh, Protestants will use that to mean, well, therefore, he couldn't have been talking about flesh. But if you look about how strongly he emphasized that this really is flesh, then contextually, that, that statement that the flesh availeth nothing, he must be changing the meaning of that somewhat. Uh, and, and it's almost an offhand comment. So I think in that context, the flesh availing nothing means that, that the common worldly understanding of things is, is what doesn't avail. So if, if you look at the strength of what he is saying, uh, that's really the only way to, I think, reconcile these two passages, that flesh in that second, uh, in that second passage is just being used in a different way, a different context uh, from the rest of this long narrative in which he is speaking most graphically about gnawing on his actual body and drinking his blood. So. Uh, Important point. Important point there. All right. Well, let's move along. Yeah, I hand. Jerry. Uh, I was going to go to uh, Corinthians uh, chapter 11, uh, verse 26. For as often as you shall eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord Jesus until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks of this cup of the Lord unworthily will be guilty of the body and blood of our Lord. First or second Corinthians? First Corinthians. First Corinthians. And uh, what was? First Corinthians uh, 11. First Corinthians 11. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that is actually uh, probably the oldest account of the Last Supper that we have. It probably predates uh, the accounts in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, certainly John. Uh, it, it predates the, the synoptic accounts by a few years. Uh, and and St. Paul says very clearly, you know, bad things happen if, if you don't recognize this as the uh, body and blood of Christ or if you're somehow unworthy. Uh, so, yes, that's, a, that's an important one as well. Um, so, yeah, this is, like I say, selected passages here, but that's a good one because, yeah, that is, that's really the oldest account of the Mass, the first Mass we have. Uh, and uh, let's talk a little bit more about that. The, the Last Supper and the First Mass uh, are the same thing. And it's also something else. It's also what kind of celebration? What is the Last Supper? What is the first Mass? It's a Passover Seder. Yes. Uh, I remember, and Jenny can help me here, is it uh, Ros Moss? Uh, Rosalind Moss, is she the, the Jewish convert to? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and now she's a nun. She started an order. Uh, but uh, she was Jewish. She became an evangelical Protestant. Uh, much like our own Jason Levitt, uh, Debbie's husband, and then became Catholic. And while she was an evangelical Protestant, she came to a Mass, uh, her first Mass, and she watched the Mass. And her immediate reaction, her immediate reaction was actually a negative one, but it's very revealing. She said, no, no, this is not right. We're, we're going backwards from Christianity. This is a Passover Seder. <laughs> yes, it is a Passover Seder. Right, precisely, exactly, you've got it. Um, that, that the Mass is, is a Passover. It's, uh, it is the fulfillment and completion of the Passover, but it's very, very Jewish, uh, which once again, uh, it, it is mind-boggling why many good Christians throughout the centuries have been anti-Semitic. <laughs> Go figure. Uh, well, um, yes, let's, let's look at the, uh, the Matthew account, the Luke account. I'm just, I'm whipping these things out. Uh, and once again, uh, I'm stealing a lot from Scott Hahn here. Uh, let's, let's begin with the basic words. This is my body. This is the cup of my blood. Do this in memory of me. Now, I, I think you can say, make some of the same arguments here that uh, 
about metaphor or about figures of speech, that Jesus does not correct this and, and say, what I meant to say was, uh, he, he doesn't do that. And also, usually when Jesus is making some sort of metaphorical about this is this, I am the vine, you are the branches, it's usually I am this, I am that, I am whatever, I am, but, but this time it's reversed. This is my body. So just right there in its structure, it seems a little bit set apart. I, I'm not sure if, you know, if that works universally, but it certainly does get my attention. Uh, and let's talk now, yeah. I thought you were going to say he's not speaking in a parable. Yes, the, well, yeah, exactly, you know, he's, he's good. Yeah, it's very literally. Um, and once again, one of the... Uh, well, it is interesting, and it's fascinating because one of the, uh, and and I don't I don't mean you know I'm not bashing Protestants here, uh, we but we live especially in a pretty heavily Protestant part of the world, and a lot of people who come into RCIA are bringing a Protestant background, and so I'm I'm using Protestantism as compare and contrast. Uh, Y'all know my statements that uh, uh, that. You know, you're going to you're going to find a lot of Protestants in heaven, and and I I fear for the souls of many Catholics, uh, but but I do do this to compare to in order to to clarify our own thought. But I must say, uh, one truly stupid Protestant argument I've heard uh, is how could that be Jesus? How could that piece of bread be Jesus' body when Jesus in his body was sitting right there in front of him? Well, let's see. It's called uh, I don't know. A miracle, <laughs> you know, uh, with God, nothing shall be impossible. <laughs> so, uh, so interesting point. But, but let's talk about this for a minute, because you got the body of Christ in this original bread. You got the body of Christ, which is less than 24 hours later, broken on the cross and the blood spilled. And then you have in every Catholic mass down to today, and presumably here on out for the end of time, the body of Christ again in the form of bread, and, and, the, and the blood in the form of wine. It stresses a continuity here. Continuity. And so let's look at this particular Passover Seder. And I had printed off some really great notes on this Passover Seder, and I, of course, forgot them! Yay! So I can't throw in some fancy Hebrew terms that I wanted to. But as I understand it, uh, that in a Passover Seder, there is a sharing of four cups of wine. Uh, there is a preliminary cup, and then there is a cup that sort of kicks off the Passover Seder prop proper. Uh, then there is another cup, which is sort of the climax of the whole shebang. And then there is a cup at the end. And if, I, if I'm remembering correctly, this may be, you, you folks out there in TV land, I may be making this up. I may have been smoking too much dope before I got in here, forgive me. Uh, uh, that, that the celebrant says something like, it is finished or it is accomplished, or that may be what the high priest says at the end of the high sacrifice. Um, well, if you count the cups, and I will let you, I'll let you read the accounts, I'm not going to go fishing through these accounts, but apparently the cup in which Jesus says, this is the cup of my blood, would be analogous if you, if you break down at the points at which they sing the hymn and, and this sort of thing. It's analogous to the third cup. And then after that, Jesus gets up and goes out to pray. Problem. Where's the fourth cup? He, there, there's no fourth cup. This Passover gets cut off right in the middle. It would be like you coming to Mass, and, and Mass is just cruising along great, and everything's going fine, and we get, to, uh, we get to the liturgy of the Eucharist. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and gave th when he gave him thanks, he blessed it and, and broke it and said, the Mass has ended, go in peace. And he was walking off. Something wrong here, something kind of key missing here, right? You follow this down, through the next day and the crucifixion and at the very end and I forget in what you, what, which account it may be it actually may be in John's account when he finally drinks uh, some vinegar or sour wine and when he had taken it he says it is finished and gave up his spirit 
Did we find the fourth cup? There you go. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, it is finished. Once again, non-Christians will take that as a sign of despair. It's finished. I'm dead. Yeah. He's dead, Jim. All right. Uh, you know, the better understanding of it is accomplished. Well, our salvation isn't accomplished. It's not fully complete until one. when? His resurrection, his ascension. Uh, so what is, what is finished at that point? What is completed? The, the, the Seder, the one through Passover. So they're one and the same. They're one and the same. Uh, which brings us to modern day masses, and I've already done my William Faulkner's Intruder in the Dust speech. You know, the important part of the Barakah prayer, uh, which I believe is the Passover prayer, which the idea of remember isn't remember what happened back then, it's remember that you're part of the story. And I won't go through the whole, uh, I won't go through the whole, through the whole Intruder in the Dust thing. Well, yes, I will, since I'm being taped here, somebody may see this at some point. And, and this is the best way to get Southerners to understand the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass and the idea that each and every Mass is the sacrifice on Calvary, the continuation of the same sacrifice. And it's Faulkner's statement that history isn't was, history is, that we're still living the history that has made us. And he is speaking in this book, Intruder in the Dust, about the Battle of Gettysburg. It's all now, you see. Yesterday won't be over until tomorrow. And tomorrow began 10,000 years ago. For every southern boy, 14 years old, not once, but whenever he wants it. It's still not yet 2 o'clock on that hot July afternoon, with the troops ready and the guns laid and ready in the woods. And Pickett himself, with his long oiled ringlets and his hat in one hand, probably, and his sword in the other, looking up the hill, waiting for Longstreet to give the word. And it's all in the balance. It hasn't happened yet. It hasn't even begun yet. There is still a chance that it won't happen at that time and in those circumstances that made more men than Garnett and Kemper and Wilcox and Armistead look grave. Yet it's going to happen. We all know that. We have come too far, traveled too long, and it doesn't even take a 14-year-old boy to think, this time, maybe this time, with all this much to gain and all this much to lose. Pennsylvania, Maryland, the golden dome of Washington itself to crown with desperate and unbelievable glory the desperate gamble made two years ago. Or to anyone who has sailed out on the sea on a raft to think, this is it, the moment to turn back now or sail on inevitably over the world's roaring rim. You want to know Gettysburg? Look around the South today. You know, we're still living it. It makes you part of the story. Uh, it's not just remember something that happened, uh, which once again, uh, a lot of times, uh, especially in evangelical churches, uh, you know, you'll see something inscribed on the altar. Uh, we have uh, and have had in the past in the Adoration Chapel, my Lord and my God, but what you'll often see on evangelical altars is, do this in remembrance of me. And that's more of a, let's remember what happened. It's not the barakah. It's not, you know, you're part of it. It's happening here in front of you now. Uh, and, and that's an important thing. So this, this idea of the annihilation of time, that uh, the sacrifice on Calvary and the Last Supper and every Catholic Mass and the Book of Re Revelation, which is the wedding feast of the Lamb, are all one and the same thing. We annihilate time. We step out of time completely. Uh, once again, as, uh, as Captain Janeway once told uh, Ensign Harry Kim, you're in Starfleet, Harry. Weird is part of the job. You know, this is, this is, we're playing with time and space here, folks. I mean, this is groovy, isn't it? So, yeah, I don't, it must have been LSD I was smoking. Do people smoke LSD? I don't know. <laughs> Y'all can tell I really know a lot about this drug culture. Okay. Uh, so, so the idea of the Passover beginning one night and continuing, that the, that the Seder and the crucifixion are inseparable, it's an important thing. And, and also, let's, let's look at some other matters, and we'll pop back to Exodus here, because what is the Passover celebrating? What is it telling those Jews in that room that they are part of? They are part of the flight out of Egypt. They're part of it. You're it. You're people. Your blood 
came out of Egypt under the guidance of God. You're still living this story. And one way we emphasize that, what, uh, in order for, for the firstborn children, firstborn sons, to be spared in Exodus, what had to happen? What was the sign of God, if you will, entering into a covenant or some sort of, uh, some sort of agreement, an exchange of persons with the children of Israel that night in Egypt? Okay, what kind of lamb? Perfect. Perfect, without blemish, without broken legs. Oh, by the way, did you notice that uh, the centurion does not break Jesus' legs? Because it wasn't prophesied. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't prophesied, and also it would have been, you know, you don't, we don't deal with lambs with broken legs. And Jesus is a lamb. What does cousin John Baptist say to him? You know, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. What is said over and over again in Revelation? The Lamb of God. Um, Jesus is the Lamb. So, in addition to killing that lamb and splattering its blood all over the place, what else do you have to do with it? You have to eat the thing. Yeah, you don't, you don't eat animal crackers. This is straight Scott Hahn. I'm sorry, Scott, you know, you know so whatever. But, yeah, you don't eat lamb, wait, lamb cookies. You, know, you, you have to partake of the actual lamb or your baby's going to wake up dead the next morning. So... The, the relationship here between Exodus 12, between John 6, and between the, uh, uh, the narratives and the synoptics of the Passover Seder, and then if you throw in Paul and 1 Corinthians for good measure, you see where this is going. Uh, it, it's really presenting a very, very strong case uh, for the real presence. It, just straight out of Scripture. Forget Trent. Forget the church fathers. Just look at the Bible. Uh, so, and if you say, well, yeah, but there's still a good argument for there not being a real presence, then I say, well, then we can't know, can we, unless somebody tells us with authority. So if God is in the business of revealing himself to us, he must have done a pretty shoddy job of it, because we don't know. We don't know what is and what is not God, which is all the more reason why we must have some sort of authoritative interpreter here on earth, we call that authoritative interpreter the magisterium of the Catholic Church. And uh, that's why sometimes people spend millions of dollars to get a case to the Supreme Court, uh, because you need an authoritative answer. Uh, unlike the Supreme Court, the Catholic Church, when making a statement of doctrine, never gets it wrong. So, um, so if you say that there's a good argument against the real presence, all the more reason for the truth of the Catholic Church and the Catholic Church says, yes, and the argument which is correct is real presence. Uh, so very, yeah, very crucial stuff there. Uh, one last scriptural point that I'll bring up is the, uh, the Emmaus Road story, which probably is the second Mass. Um, words of eternal life. Uh, Walk to Emmaus. Now, on that same day, this is, uh, uh, this is right after the resurrection. This is Luke 24. Now, on that same day, two of them, two of the disciples, we're going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And uh, you're just talking to me about the Emmaus Walk. Uh, you, want to, you want to help us here? Well, there's a debate still whether it's seven miles from Jerusalem or it's 27 miles. Debate. Seven miles or 27 miles? Yeah. And I, as I explained to you, as I was there and went along the terrain, it would be almost impossible to be 27 miles because you couldn't walk. It's just impossible to walk because it's in between mountain, mountainous area. And it's, even to this day, it's almost impassable. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Very interesting. And seven, once again, interesting number there. The number of, of perfection, of, of godliness, along with 12. Okay, so seven miles from Jerusalem. And talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, shall I keep going? How, how, how familiar are we with Emmaus Road? Let me, I'll go ahead and read it. Uh, while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? 
they replied the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who is a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed, why am I reading all this, let's move on down, uh, should suffer these things, things about himself. As they came near the village, he walked with them, stay with us, because it's almost over. So he went in to stay with them at their urging. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed, and broke it and gave it to them. Important. Took, blessed, broke, and gave. That's exactly the same sequence that we get in, all, in the synoptics. Uh, that's, that's crucial to the celebration of Mass. Then, and by the way, I skipped over the part where Jesus was apparently preaching like a Baptist preacher. I mean, really going, uh, because they said, uh, he, they say later, did our hearts not burn within us? as he was preaching. So, um, you know, we have to remember, Jesus was quite a good preacher, apparently. Uh, but it's at this point, when he took, not when he preached, but when he took, blessed, broke, and gave the bread to them, their eyes were opened and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. And then they said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road? Uh, and then they went back and told Peter, I think. They told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Now, I, 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 you know, that's not as compelling for the real presence, but, you know, it still does point us back to the Mass and to the celebration of the sacrament as, as truly an important thing. Well, uh, it, it is, to me, mm -hmm. um, it points to the Eucharist okay. because it was revealed to them who he was when he broke the bread, mm -hmm. it, it became clear to them who he was. Isn't it amazing that they walked that seven miles, didn't know who he was, even though he talked mm -hmm. to himself that whole time? Well, yeah, and, and you know, now that you bring it up, I, I would like to read the Greek of we knew him in the breaking of the bread. Uh, it, it's almost like the attention is being drawn to the bread that is not bread. That's so, not awesome. hmm? yes, okay. <laughs> It is also very important to, to note that after the Mass, his physical presence is no longer needed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. And he, he is there. He disappeared once they realized yeah. he was there. Yeah. He's got a physical body. I mean, he does things like show up and say, you got anything to eat? And then he eats a fish right in front of him. I mean, to show that you know, this is not a ghost you're looking at. Stick your hand here. Stick your hand in my side and that sort of thing. So he's clearly a physical body. But... It is a very changed physical body. He can walk through walls. He disappears, he appears, he shows up. So there is something very different about him. And, uh, and, and his bodily, tangible presence no longer seems to be quite as important. So, um, uh, yeah, important point, important point. So, yeah. I think that's kind of like, you know, you have to uh, recognize it with, um, uh, she, he vanished after the breaking of the bread because he's already in, in the bread. Yes, so he's still there, in a sense. So, very good, very good. So, yeah, for, so anybody who tells you there's not good scriptural basis for the real presence, uh, you know, they're going to have a lot of wrestling to do with this. Um, and, and that's important. Uh, regarding the, the, the position of the Eucharist in the, in the sacraments and in the Catholic liturgy and the Catholic life. Uh, and it, I've talked about this at stages before, but it is arguably the most important sacrament. The, the only other possible contender is baptism. Uh, baptism being necessary for the celebration of any other sacrament. Uh, you cannot validly receive the Eucharist, for instance, unless you are validly baptized. Uh, so, so, so those are the two most important, and I think a, a good recognition that these are the two most important do come from the Protestant community because the, the churches that have done away with any of the sacraments, the ones they, they, they always keep or the ones that they tend to keep, are baptism and the Lord's Supper, even though their understandings of those may be different. So, so that's very important. Um, it was Thomas Aquinas, and, and I like his reasoning. Um, that the Eucharist is most important. 
and that it is actually what, and Mark can help me out here, I believe it's John Paul the Great, called the Eucharist the source and summit of the Christian life. Am I correct, Jeff, Mark? Good? Okay. Uh, the source and summit, the summit, the high point, the, the, that third cup, if you will. Uh, reason being, all of the other sacraments you can see as oriented towards the Eucharist. Uh, you celebrate baptism so you can partake of the Eucharist. We have confirmation so you can get more grace out of the Eucharist. We have reconciliation or confession or penance so you can come back to the Eucharist. We have uh, priestly orders, holy orders, so the priest can confect the Eucharist. We have anointing of the sick so you can get better and come back to the Eucharist. We have the sacrament of matrimony so you can, you can, make, you can, you can work with God <laughs> just as in the second and third chapters of Genesis. Uh, you can work as a partner with God in the creation of more souls who can come to the Eucharist. So, you know, it, everything points to that. Uh, everything points to it, uh, and, and that's very important. Um, which brings us to, uh, to uh, an important modern-day question, uh, a confusing one, and one that is frankly causing uh, controversy and even discord within the church. Uh, and, and that is about what is happening with so-called Catholic politicians or public figures who are pro-choice who insist on receiving communion. Uh, and this is an important thing. And this takes us, once again, this takes us back to our talk of Sunday, the idea of communion, union with. Uh, the word Eucharista, uh, the, the Greek, by the way, means thanksgiving. Uh, the breaking of the bread is another phrase for it. But, but let's focus on communion and being in union with. Um, uh, it, it's very clear that the Catholic Church has taught from the beginning, and you can find the, some of the earliest documents. How do you pronounce Didache? Is it Didache? Is that good enough? You know, one of the very earliest teachings. You know, abortion, you can't, you know, it's murder. It, it is murder, or if not murder, it's very... It's a very, very bad thing. You know, this has been clear Catholic teaching from the beginning. And once again, if you, if you want to get the Catholic Church out of the way, you biblical people, and look straight at the Bible. Uh, by the way, it's the Catholic Church who put the Bible together for us, so you can't really do that. I'm being, I'm being facetious, of course. But you know, I, I knew you in, your wo in the womb you know, before you were born, uh, yeah, that, that life begins at conception. But Practically every big name Catholic politician in this country is pro-choice, uh, and and they make a big deal out of it too. Uh, Nancy Pelosi, uh, recently Ted Kennedy, John Kerry, um, uh, Joe Biden, uh, just and, and the beat goes on. They all do that, and they do that for a variety of reasons. But part of the reason they do that is because the church failed them. Y'all all, all know my belief that in the wake of the Second Vatican Council, one of, one of the unforeseen, unanticipated, unwanted results of Vatican II was that Catholic catechesis went down the commode. Uh, we've had nearly two generations of Catholics now who have been denied their birthright as Catholics because nobody taught them the faith properly. And one of the basics is that if you don't accept all of the doctrines of the Catholic Church, you can call yourself Catholic all day. You're not Catholic. Uh, you are, in essence, you're Protestant because you're saying that my conscience trumps the magisterium. Go back to the exchange between Martin Luther and there's a bishop, and I never can pull his name up, but at the Diet of Worms. And it really, to this day, they are the two clearest statements of Catholicism versus Protestantism. The bishop says, Martin, do you really think that you, one Catholic priest, knows better than 1,500 years of apostles and priests and bishops and popes? I mean, does it really matter of you being in step and them all being out of step? Does that really make sense? And that's, that's really a great statement of Catholicism. Luther's response unless it can be proved to me by scripture or by right reason, then I'm not going to believe it. I can do nothing else. Here I stand. God help me. Um, 
unless you can prove it to me, unless I can approve it. And, and who's to say his reason's going to be right? Uh, that's Protestantism. So the minute you say, I'm a good Catholic, except for the doctrine of, you are saying one of two things. You're saying the Catholic, either you're saying that the Catholic Church can commit doctrinal error, and the, and the word for that is Protestant. Or you are saying that the Catholic Church is right, it isn't committing doctrinal error, it's true, but I refuse to accept it. And in which case, if you're really saying that, you're jeopardizing your soul. And I hope to God that most people who say that don't mean it that way, and I don't think they do. Uh, we have been taught, brought up to believe that you really can disagree with, with fundamental church doctrines and still be Catholic. Uh, and it's wrong. So if you, are, if you are on that different a page from the church, you've excommunicated yourself. Uh, the Code of Canon Law says if you procure an abortion, you are instantly and immediately ex latentia, latentia sentia, I'm getting the Latin wrong, excommunicated. Nobody has to pronounce anything. You know, there doesn't have to be any sort of medieval inquisition and they you know, strike the, the, uh, the crozier or whatever on the floor. You know, it happens. You know, the minute John Kerry votes for funding for, uh, for abortion anywhere in the world, um, he has just enabled the killing of one of his brethren or sisters. He's in a state of mortal sin. Why does he even want to receive communion in that circumstance? Yeah. Is that apart from knowledge as well? Hmm? Apart from knowledge as well. Knowledge, uh, re apart explain. Apart from his knowing that that is communication, it is still a um, I would have to actually read it. There may be a knowingly in there as well. Um, I, I'm, picking, I'm picking on our Catholic leaders because I cannot believe that it has not now been explained to them by appropriate authority. Uh, the biggest exchange came with Patrick Kennedy, who I think is Ted Kennedy's son, who is a United States representative from Rhode Island. He actually, about two months ago, uh, he drew first. Uh, he, he made public this letter uh, that, that his bishop had sent him saying he has told me that I shouldn't receive communion in the diocese and that he has told all the priests of the diocese not to give me communion. And the bishop wrote back, well, you know, this was a private letter. It's, it's Representative Kennedy that's chosen to make, make it public, but the fact is I never told my priest that. He's overstated the case. And Kennedy kept on going. You know, the fact that I'm pro-choice doesn't make me any less of a Catholic. And Bishop Tobin said, well, actually it does, and here's why. You have, you have cut off your communion with Holy Mother Church. Uh, to receive communion in that circumstance is to make a false statement. Uh, so, you know, these, you know, these people keep on insisting that they're Catholic while not living out their Catholic faith. Now, a couple of other, and I'm just doing this because you're likely to get some heat about this as a Catholic at some point if it comes up. Uh, a couple of other points I will bring up. Uh, about this. Uh, you know, they, they say, how dare, how dare Rome tell a politician he can't do this? How, ter how dare, dare Rome can't tell you that you can, you have to, that, that you can follow your own conscience? All right. You have to follow your conscience. You've heard me say this before. You have got to follow your conscience. Uh, your conscience is the Holy Spirit speaking to you. But, and, and, and that's Catholic teaching. But it's very interesting that the people who usually bring this up don't tell you the second half of that teaching. The second half is that the properly formed conscience will never be in disagreement with the magisterium. You know, you're supposed to submit your conscience for formation to the church. Uh, and and, and yeah, that's, that's an important omission there. Uh, another important point is that they'll then say, well, we have separation of church and state here. You know, he, he may be a Catholic, but he can't force his opinions on us. And that is, that's one big argument that the pro-choice people give. Mario Cuomo came up with that one. I am personally opposed to abortion, but I can't force my views on anyone else. Now, can you imagine it if somebody said, I'm personally opposed to slavery, but I'm not going to tell you you can't own any. I mean, what would happen if a politician today said something like that? All right? I'm personally opposed to rape, but if any of you guys just got to go out there and get some tonight, I'm not, I can't, I can't, who am I to tell you you can't do that? 
you, you see how patently ridiculous that is when you, when you shift the context a little bit. Uh, and I'll tell you something else. Follow your own way. But don't hold yourself out as a Catholic. We have a right to police our trademark. You're confusing people. So, you know, we're not trying to impose Catholicism uh, unconstitutionally. Uh, one more point, legislating morality, um, and this sort of is getting away from the Eucharist, but uh, just while I'm on the subject, uh, somebody name me a law that doesn't legislate morality. Name me any law. Name me one. I'm waiting. Red means stop, green means go. That doesn't sound very moral or have anything to do with morality. Well, uh, it's arbitrary, but what it does is it establishes a rule so we stop, uh, we tra stop traffic accidents. Well, so what? Well, why do we stop traffic accidents? Because they're expensive and they hurt people. And why is that bad? Well, because hurting people is bad and, and spending money is bad. Oop, we use the word bad, we've gotten into morals. So it's not a question of legislating morality. Every law legislates morality. It's just a question of whose morality gets legislated. But I, I have gotten a feel. But the point is that that reception of communion has become a very, very casual thing. And you see, you see a pendulum throughout Catholic history on this. And it can swing too far in either direction. Uh, in the 1200s, 1300s, 1400s, the pendulum was way too far in one direction. People were afraid to receive communion almost at any time because you know to receive communion in a state of sin you know you heard what St. Paul said you know bad business they didn't want to do that and it got so bad uh, after a while that late in the 19th century or early in the 20th one of the popes and one of you enlightened folks can help me here actually set forth an encyclical saying encouraging the frequent reception of communion because people weren't going to communion enough they had to say look folks you know, get out of the pew and go up there and receive communion. Receive the Eucharist. It'll do you good. Uh, well, 100 years later, the pendulum has swung in the other direction. People receive it casually. They receive it without observing an hour's fast. They, they receive it without going to confession. Uh, they apparently receive it without any intention of going to confession. They receive it for photo ops. Um, I'm going to have a lot of explaining to do uh, when I die. Um, so I'm not slamming everybody. Nobody is perfect. Uh, we cannot judge, we cannot judge the state of anybody's soul. We have to judge actions. We have to. And if somebody is being too casual about receiving communion and going up casually uh, and going up in a state of mortal sin, you know, the only person, well, they're, they're hurting themselves. They're hurting themselves grievously and they're also hurting the body of Christ. Yeah. Can a can a uh, a priest, you know, refuse someone communion? I mean, if, if yes, I mean, um, um, why don't they? Well, it probably it yeah it probably happens some uh, for pastoral reasons. Usually, if there is an excommunication, you're going to see what Bishop Tobin did. You know, the bishop is, or the priest, but more likely the bishop, will probably call you in for a private consultation. And said, look, you know, you you can't keep doing this um, uh, because you know it's. Yeah, it's part of the old idea. Give praise in public. If you have to administer correction, do it in private. Don't make a spectacle of it. Um, uh, also, uh, our bishops today, and by the way, uh, about 40 or 50, well, more like 50 years ago, when some Louisiana politicians uh, who were Catholic and openly segregationist refused to renounce segregation, what do you guess what their bishops did? You can't come to communion, dude. Uh, so, you know, when... when when people get all all upset, you know, about bishops talking about doing that today, they forget that they probably would have been singing a different tune 50 years ago. Um, yeah, you do it in private, but also, unfortunately, and and what I'm about to say, I have not run by Father McDonald or the pastoral staff here. This is my own own speaking. I take full responsibility for it. But generally speaking, we have had a pretty sorry few crops of bishops the last 40 years in this country. Uh, you can trace it back to 1968, horrible year in American history. See me about it sometime if you, if you want the story. But the bishops uh, decided to be non-confrontational in the face of dissent. The idea is honey versus vinegar. And what happened was dissent uh, saw that as weakness has run rampant 
And bishops now see themselves more as administrators and managers as opposed to teachers of the faith. So very few bishops today will open, openly stand up uh, in this country and say, you know, if you are not in communion with the church, and, and the biggie is usually abortion, um, uh, because everything else, uh, it, you know, it, abortion is an intrinsic evil. If you're not in communion, you don't receive communion. Uh, not many bishops will do that. We do have a few. Chaput, uh, Raymond Burke, uh, Bishop Tobin, uh, Cardinal Justin Regali is probably good. You're seeing more and more. We're, we're coming out of this bad post-Vatican II slump when, when things just got wild. And we're moving more towards correction. But there is a lot of inertia there that we're going to have to overcome and a lot of teaching we're going to have to do. And once again, this is where the church needs you candidates and catechumens. Uh, this is a good Orthodox parish. You are hearing true Catholic teaching in this parish. And I have been in parishes where that is not true, and it's, they're horrible places to be. We need you all to get out there and help. Yeah. Just to shift a little bit, mm -hmm. um, we as Catholics believe true presence. You'll hear that, true presence. Mm -hmm. Would it be fair if I for you to kind of break down for us what other traditions, Protestant traditions, who are akin to, you know, the, uh, they are akin to, uh, to us, mm -hmm. the Anglicans, the Lutherans, what they believe about, about the Eucharist. I'll try, but with 30,000 denominations, yeah, I'll hit the big ones. Well, we'll start with the Lutherans, uh, and I can get some help from this quarter if I, if I screw it up, because Luther had some issues with the real presence. What he came up with uh, was, I'm not sure if he came up with it, but, but he certainly made it stick with, uh, with the Lutherans, uh, was not transubstantiation, which literally means uh, substance changing across or something like that, but consubstantiation. And actually, consubstantiation is a Catholic idea, too, in a different context. Uh, for instance, the Son is consubstantial with the Father. Um, uh, and that means, whereas transubstantiation was it's bread, and now it's not bread, but something else. Consubstantiation means it's bread along with something else. That at the words of consecu consecration, the bread and wine are infused with the real spirit of Christ, and the two exist together. Am I doing, how am I doing yeah, with this? That's right. It's yeah. just the phrase that uses that Jesus is present in, with, and under the bread of wine. Yes, in, with, and under the bread of, and wine. Um, so yes. of all Protestants probably are the closest to Catholics and believing that the real I would, I would say yes with two exceptions. They don't like the idea of what they see as a sacrifice over and over again. Right, right. So, which, as you understand, it's not a sacrifice over and over again. It's joining in the one, one sacrifice. Um, and, and you hear that in the Eucharistic prayer, the one, you know, a one uh, complete sacrifice. Uh, question, what happens to any unconsumed elements? It's different than in the Anglican Church, mm -hmm. where it's, it's not put into a tabernacle thing like in the Catholic Church mm -hmm. also. The, the priest has to consume the rest of it and the wine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, is there any occasion when it's... Yeah. No, no, that's fine. Is there any occasion when it's taken in back or, and just you know, thrown away or something? I don't know. I mean, no. Okay, it's got to be consumed. You might be able to reserve it for the sick, but I think usually they just start anew and bless it anew for going to the sick. Right, right, okay. Um, Terry, you mentioned the Anglicans. That's complicated. The Anglicans themselves, uh, there's a huge split in it. If you read the 39 articles, and I will defer to Carlton on this one, uh, the 39 articles. Uh, and I can't tell you which one, but it very clearly denounces transubstantiation as a Romish doctrine. Uh, it also denounces Eucharistic processions because it's not to be paraded about. Now that being said, there are a lot of Anglicans today who do believe, do have a very Catholic concept of the real presence. And, and, and so the church sort of leaves it up to yourself. And that shows the great weakness of Anglicanism because it always has been from the beginning an agreement to disagree. And if the Anglicans can't agree on what is and is not God, uh, you know, it's, it's agnostic. It's not really, you know, it, it's a real problem. Um, for those of you, if we get more evangelical, I'll let you help me, but it's purely a symbolic idea, uh, an historical celebration. And it's often not even called a sacrament. It's called an ordinance. 
Uh, and the idea of sacrament is it's something sacred, that it's, it is a mechanism through which grace is conveyed. Uh, you now, some Protestants do have the sacramental idea. A sacrament is an outward visible sign of an inward invisible grace. Um, that's a Protestant definition. It's close to a Catholic definition. Uh, the difference of the Catholic definition is that it's not just a sign of an inward invisible grace. It's an efficacious sign. It's a sign that does what it signifies. It's like that exit sign, uh, in, and I've done this before, in, in Protestant uh, sacramental theology, it signifies for us that that door is a gateway to the outside. Uh, in the Catholic understanding, that sign reaches out, grabs us, and pulls us through the door, uh, which is a little bit extra. Uh, actually, it's a lot extra. But there are, are some uh, Protestants that don't even have a sacramental notion. For them, uh, communion and baptism are ordinances of God. Uh, and we just do that uh, uh, as a sort of memory. Um, I know I have a Presbyterian pastor friend, and I was talking with him about this one point, and I asked him what would happen if somebody received com or took communion or what, whatever the phrase is in the Presbyterian church unworthily or without much reflection or, or something like that. And he said, it'd be a bad thing. Yeah, I mean, you know, we, you know, we really are serious about that. And that struck me as a tragedy. And, and knowing his congregation, I believe it, that, that a congregation of Presbyterians who do not believe in the real presence are more devout and and more respectful of their bread and grape juice than many Catholics are of the actual body and blood of Christ. That is scandalous. I mean, I'm pleased for him, but you know, I just want to tear my clothes uh, over 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 Catholics, uh, and that's an important thing. So that's that's kind of a, a spread. There are probably a million nuances there, but uh, can't help you. Uh, let's keep the questions going. Um, surely we've got some questions here. So, I know for me, as a not a cradle Catholic, mm -hmm. but a convert, the two most hard, the two hardest obstacles for me were Mary mm -hmm. and transubstantiation. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the way that I was blessed was I prayed about it and I just researched it and just read and read as much as I could, and then it just I just accepted it as a mystery. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Yeah. It's a mystery. We don't understand it. We won't understand it until we get to heaven. I'm not even sure if we'll understand it then. <laughs> so, but, but a good point. Well, I, we'll probably understand more. Yeah, hold on for just a second. I'll get, or, or is, are you adding on to hers? Does it work? If it's changing, I'll get... Yeah. In a way. Okay. Um, it, it, a convert as well. But doesn't like that term. But no, it's um, wrong. It's evil. For me as well. Two things. Jesus very little about what this is and what is in that cup. Very little. And go back to the sixth chapter of John and see the context of he, he reiterates this several times about what this is. And, and that, that point that disciples, believers in him, could not accept that. That, that just that struck me. It just pointed, and, and and really that was the that was the big thing for my conversion was true presence. But when I put those two things together, the, what happened at the Eucharistic table, the Last Supper, and the context of what happened in John six, that Jesus continued not once, twice, three, four times about <coughs> I am the bread of life eat my flesh, drink my blood. It just continued and continued, and he let them walk away. And he did not say, whoops, I meant this. He didn't do that. And, and that, that, that was really the point that my heart heard. You know, I, um, and Jane brings up an important point, that, you know, that we will never fully understand it. And, and once again, with the Eucharist, we've really got to look at that really hard because the only one who can understand God fully is God. Um, and, and we can come to greater depths of understanding, but we're never going to get to the bottom. It's a bottomless pool. Um, and if you look at, at the magisterial statements on the Eucharist, 
and on anything else, they're usually put in the negative. If anyone says that, uh, that transubstantiation is not true or the real presence is not the correct way to understand this, then they're wrong. Uh, usually they put it in much less temperate terms than that. Uh, but the point is they put it in negative terms. It's, it's a guardrail. We can't fully put into words what it is. But if they say that it isn't this, then they're over the guardrail. Uh, they're too far afield. Uh, so it doesn't attempt to nail down God. It, it attempts to, to get some of the rubbish out of the way, but we'll never get to the end of the road, the bottom of the pool, because there's always more to understand. Um, so uh, any other questions? Any, any questions or comments at all about how this works? Or, bottom line is yes. the two terms, faith and conscience. Mm -hmm. that's, that's really what the whole thing is. You have to have faith to, to believe mm -hmm. all this, and then your conscience tells you right and wrong. And, right. and if you take the time to know what the right and wrong mm -hmm. is that, through your faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and just you know, let yourself be taught by the church. So, um, but otherwise, I don't know. I don't know of all the. You know, of all of the Catholic things, you know, statue worshiping and all that stuff, I don't know why the Protestants react so strongly to the idea of the real presence. I don't know why. Um, I, I, that's that's kind of a, secret, a mystery to me. Um, but you know, I do know that a lot of people. I had, and I actually had this happen to someone Sunday. Uh, I was getting set up for RCIA Sunday. Terry and I were down here, and some somebody came in. Is he here tonight? No. But uh, he said, uh, he apparently, he essentially just walked in off the street. Uh, he had been baptized, I think, as a Pentecostal or some sort of holiness uh, person. He had, uh, I think, fairly recently. He's been coming to, with his family to St. Joseph for a year. They, he really knows very little Catholic theology. He was asking me what these Tuesday night programs were. And I said, well, those are for Catholics coming back to the church. What you really need to come to is the Thursday night RCIA. But we talked some for a while, and he said that, you know, when his wife came in, she was uh, uh, some sort of evangelical, and she said she just felt something in this church. Um, and I didn't tell him that because, you know, he didn't have the background, but, you know, I immediately thought, you know, what you were feeling was the real presence. And I have read the stories of so many Protestants and, and maybe even non-Christians who have that same reaction when they come into a Catholic church. They're, they just feel something there. Now that's that's very visceral. Uh, you know, it's, it's certainly at the gut level, maybe even supernatural. But, you know, I've heard it from too many people for it to be a coincidence. Uh, and I'm seeing a lot of nods going on out there right now. So... Uh, Give some of these cherry blossom tours mm -hmm. and have some of these folks come in from all over the country who are not Catholic. Mm -hmm. And you hear some interesting comments yeah. when they come into this church. Yeah, so... so it's not just how beautiful it is. Mm -hmm. right. Yes. So, um, and, and once again, a failure, a failure to, to do what you're supposed to with the Eucharist, um, you know, it scandalizes the church because it, it sets you up as a bad example to other people. It muddles things. Um, so, you know, it's deserving of our utmost reverence. And, you know, that's, that's what you guys have to do, help us with here. Uh, uh, go, go, yeah. If you don't mind going to, I mean, because this, this is kind of like pre Vatican II, mm -hmm. but we're starting to see some of this surface again. Let's just talk about <coughs> communion rail and reverence in, in the church just a little bit. And, and the Kneeling reverence and that should be time. shown towards the blessing. Yes, I mean, actually, some of the mechanical processes. All right, right now, our tabernacle in use is at the high altar. Um, yeah, we're very lucky here because we've got three altars. We have a high altar, two side altars. They all have built-in tabernacles. Uh, normally, what you will do is look for the red candle. We have a pathetic red candle. There's occasionally talk of you know, hanging one or something like that. But the red candle will usually tell you where the host is reserved. Um, so usually when coming into the church, you, you will often genuflect to it. When passing in front of it, you genuflect. So right now, if you cross the middle aisle, you would genuflect to the sacrament from there. It gets a little complicated when it's the center because you're also supposed to bow to the altar. Um, so what happens if the altar and the, and the 
tabernacle right together, I would genuflect. But, you know, it's quite possible to come in and, you know, and it, you know, it goes on for a while and out of my knees. So, but, uh, but the big one is genuflecting when you cross in front of the tabernacle. Uh, so that's the big one. Um, you know, you talk about reverence, that's very important. I'm going to get off topic just a bit, but, but still staying with your, your question. Father MacDonald is, you've noticed, we're getting more Latin. And a lot of people are, you know, why are we doing, doing so much Latin now? And Father MacDonald is pointing out that Latin was never suppressed. It is, it is still and has always been the official language of the church, or at least for the last 1,500 years. And uh, we're getting ready to get a new translation that will correct some of the, frank, frankly, errors that we are using in the Mass today. Um, we are living... Uh, this is very true of me, because I was born in the year that Vatican II began. Um, it is, to a large degree, true of everyone. Um, we are living in a time of liturgical anomaly. Okay, that as, after Vatican II, things happened really quickly, really hastily, uh, in a slipshod fashion, and frankly, some people involved in the process has had an agenda. Uh, and, and so the translate, and one example of this is the Novus Ordo. Um, so the translations are bad, they are wrong. The word credo, which is the first word in the Nicene Creed, does not mean we believe. In no way can you make that mean we believe. It means I believe. You have to take personal responsibility for it. Um, a biggie is, this is back to the Eucharist, this is my blood, the blood of the new and the everlasting covenant, Whenever you do this, do this shed for you and for all. It's not for you and for all. It is for you and for many. Pro multis, not pro omnis. So what we are doing with reinstituting the Latin and coming up with a new translation and, and pushing this reverence again is we are not changing what is normal. We are not going back to pre-Vatican II, as I just heard somebody tell me recently. You know, why are we having to go back? We're not going back to anything. We are correcting problems. We are correcting an anomaly. The problem is none of us knows anything different than the anomaly, because that's all we've had for 40 years. So we think of the anomaly as normal. Uh, what we're doing is getting back to true, to, true normality here. Um, the rail, kneeling... Uh, Kneeling is, uh, it's, it's just crowd control. <laughs> you can get through faster, and, and that's not a good thing, but you know, that is a concession that, that the church has made. So um, the altar rails were pulled out in this church because they were composite marble and they were falling down. Uh, come to a Latin Mass, Tuesdays at 5, first Sunday of the month at 2, and you will see us kneeling to receive communion. So. Yeah. But I, I want to review for everybody here, because when we go pre-Vatican II, I was like a little boy when I went to Catholic school. And we, our school had uh, eight classes. We didn't have kindergarten back then. And we had two classes for all eighth grade. So we had 16 classes in this actual school. We had 16 separate nuns, and we had a mother superior and an assistant. And so our classes in our school was totally controlled by the nuns. And when we went into Mass, we had to march into Mass, and the nuns told us where we were going to sit, how we sat, and what we were going to do. And they had rulers, didn't they? <laughs> so it, it wasn't arbitrary. You, you taught it. And you learned it by rote. And whether you, you genuflected, when you walked in the church, you genuflected because the, the host was in the center of the church. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I never forgot that. It's mm -hmm. hard to get over that because that's how I learned for eight years. Mm -hmm. okay. And that's what we've lost with Vatican II. Yes. Because we don't have nuns around to supervise what's going on. Yeah. The priest never told us how we were supposed to behave in the church. The nuns did. Mm -hmm. 
So, interesting. In a broader sense, you know, with the, in our culture, we just lost a sense of the sacred. Well, we lost a sense, not just a sense of the sacred, we lost a sense of what it meant to be Catholic. Once again, we had our birthright stolen. That the reason why you don't see as much anti-Catholicism today is because there's not as much Catholicism. You know, the minute, the minute you start behaving like a Catholic, I mean, really behaving like a Catholic, I'll guarantee you the Klan's going to pop out, and, and, and also not just the right wing, the left wing are going to pop out, and they're going to be all over you like ugly on an ape. So, um, but also, in the last 40 years, we all are old enough to know that mm -hmm. you know, the sense of the social area of just how much, I mean, so many kids and, and the kids, today's kids' parents mm -hmm. don't have res the, the sense of respect. Yep. Socially, has just yes. dropped. Yeah. Where 40, 40 years ago it was a lot mm -hmm. stronger. But well, I'm, yeah. a lot of the stuff that's happened in the Catholic Church is also something that's socially gone and gone simultaneously with it. It has. And they've reinforced each other. And sometime, sometime when we have time, I'll give you my history of the 60s. But yeah, theologically, what happened as a result of Vatican II, and it was not an intended result, which is why it's being corrected, is we got rid of the vertical, the reverence relationship of humanity to God and emphasized too much the horizontal. And in doing so, we made it a supper, you know, a, a dinner club of some sort, you know, a social club. And I think, in retrospect, the, the single worst liturgical thing is turning the priest around in the direction of the people. Because when he's looking at us and when we're looking at him, it's very easy because of the visual impact to forget that he is and we should be addressing the vertical, God the Father. When he's turned around like this, you know, it reminds you that God is present and we're all focused on him. Uh, and I think you see that trickling down to getting us back on point, the respect for the Eucharist and the reverence in Mass. But like I say, I'll give you my full 60s spiel sometime, the, the anti the anti-institutional we are church kumbaya ideal. So I will stay here and answer questions as long as y'all want to. So I'm just Is the orthodox approach being accepted by Catholic churches across the country or you're just likely to walk into one that uh, looks nothing like an orthodox Catholic church? It is it is spotty. Um, it is it is really spotty because a lot of damage was done. And it takes a lot of time to undo this damage. And unfortunately, the current today's bishops, uh, today's older bishops, were the ones who were formed in the 70s uh, and in the 60s. So, uh, you know, I think it's going to take another generation to, to move beyond that. Um, but I've been to good, I've been to bad. I have, I have been to churches which architecturally are God-awful, and I mean that in a literal sense, in which very reverent Tridentine masses are being celebrated. So it, it, it just depends. Um, There's some dioceses that are better known for being Orthodox than others. Um, but on your travels, and I will warn you about this, you know, you got to keep your holy day of obligation. When you're traveling a, a field, you got to get in Sunday Mass. Uh, you may find yourselves in some pretty terrible masses. I'm getting a look from Laura here. I know Laura and Mark had a couple of... Tries to get it right. Yeah. So, um, you know, you've just got to sort of grit your teeth and, and go with it. Um, so, yeah. Well, we have to remember, anywhere a Catholic church is still, you know, it's not, it's not the priest there, it's, it's Christ. It's yes. Priest. Yeah. And it's, you know, as long as the priest is validly ordained and he's using bread and he's using wine and he says the words of institution, you've got a valid mass. You know, no matter how bad he is personally or how bad he allows the liturgy to get or how bad taste. Um, I remember a couple of years ago somebody filmed a, a All Saints Eve uh, uh, vigil mass, a Halloween, it was on Halloween. Everybody came in costume. That was, you know, that was not the worst part to me. The, the, the part that just shocked the heck out of people the priest dressed as Barney. And, and, he, and he was doing things, instead of saying, the Lord be with you, he said, the Lord is with you. Well, that's presumptuous as hell, pardon me. Uh, it's like, we hope the Lord is with you. May the Lord be with you. And the worst of all, worse even than that, one of the Eucharistic ministers was dressed as Satan. And 
And the priest, when he got called on it, and you can probably still find this on YouTube, when the priest was called on this one, he issued an apology, but you got this feeling by reading the apology that the priest didn't even really know what the problem was. And that was scary. Uh, so, you know. Well, yeah, he was, but you know, that's just that's just banal. Uh, so, you know, the fact of the liturgy is it's not supposed to be like everyday life. You know, it's supposed to remind you that you are in the presence of God and something is different about it. So, other questions, and I, and I will open this up now, not just to the Eucharist. Any questions you've got, I'll try to answer, and I'll stay here as long as you want to throw questions at me. But yes. If you could kind of, it's a different topic, but if you could kind of um, correlate Eucharist and marriage. Well, both are breaking down the barriers between two entities, uh, the two becoming one flesh in marriage, uh, and that act, that line, the two becoming one flesh, actually probably applies to the Eucharist as well. Um, in, in a physical gut sense. Uh, and if you, if you look at you know, the definition of life, I don't even know if you've played the game of Spore or not, the video game, but you, there, you get to be more of you by consuming that which is not of you, as you can tell from me lately. Uh, and, and so in eating, I mean, that's, that's about as close as you can get, if you think about it. Um, and also, if you look sociologically at the idea of the meal or the communal meal, um, sociologically, every sacrament has some analog. Uh, baptism is birth. Confirmation is coming of age. Uh, marriage is marriage. Uh, anointing of the sick. I mean, all, all of these things have some sort of communal sociological analog. Uh, now, obviously, uh, in the Platonic Augustinian understanding, the sacraments are not an imitation of huh, real life. Real life are actually an imitation of the life that God wants us to have with Him. And that life is ultimately one of union of God. Was it, um, somebody help me, was it St. Anselm that actually put it in a very, very bald faced way? Uh, man became God so that God might become, or, or excuse me, God became man so that man might become God. Uh, a, a breaking down of the boundaries, a union. Uh, and how am I doing here? <laughs> I'm just. Uh, you want to add something? I'm just uh, thinking about like you know the marriage is also like uh, Christ marrying the bride. Yes, or, the wedding. Yeah, wedding feast of the Lamb. Which, if you if you look at the Book of Revelation, which is what the Mass is, it is the wedding feast of the Lamb. Christ as the bridegroom. Uh, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. And uh, even, actually, even uh, Protestants who believe in the rapture, I have read a book entitled Rapture. It was a horrific book. But when the rapture happens, all the people who are getting raptured, do you know what they hear? Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. So the idea of, even in, unbeknownst to them, they're adopting this, this very Catholic idea of the Mass of Christ marrying his bride, the church. Uh, and, and this is a wedding feast he's celebrating, and incidentally, uh, I'm getting into holy orders here, but that's why you can't have women priests, uh, because then you have a bride marrying a bride, and that is, that is not a fertile marriage. It doesn't, it, it's not productive. It doesn't create. Um, it completely skews the whole meaning of the Mass to have a female priest, um, which is why Pope John Paul the Great uh, 15 years ago, said, look, folks, I, as Pope, uh, as Pope, I hereby tell you, I don't have the power to change this. This is the way it's been done 2,000 years. Sorry, can't do it. And so everybody got furious with him because he was exercising so much raw power. <laughs> Go figure that. So, um, so that's, uh, that's Doc Crownell. Um, did, I did I nail it that time? Okay. Yes. Change in the practice of women wearing the veil in, in the presence of the Eucharist? If you look at the Code of Canon Law, uh, the most recent version of it is 1983. 
I have heard darn good arguments that it is still required. It is required. Um, I don't know how we've gotten out of practice. There are still a fair number of, of women here who do that. I don't know how I got started. Uh, I, I want to quote Tevya. You know, you always see that we, we, we wear these little prayer shawls. Uh, you may ask, why do we do this? I'll tell you. I don't know. But it's a tradition. Uh, I don't know how that got started. Can somebody help me there with uh, why the veils are a mark of respect? And they're absolutely gorgeous. I mean, it's just... The man removes his, hair, his hat in church so the woman covers her head in respect for the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a sign of respect. Yes. Yeah. What I heard is that a woman's hair is... Is her pride. Yes. Yes. So, so she covers it. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that works. That works. So Paul was very explicit in his uh, instruction to the Corinthians mm -hmm. about women First having their head covered in all the church, time. as I recall. Wasn't it all the time for you? Well, I think I it was that one day. Or I think it was in the church. Mm -hmm. I think it was in the church. Mm -hmm. and what, I, what Father Dan told me when he was here was that when they were getting the things from Canon, you know, the Vatican II, and that was specifically asked, mm -hmm. do women still have to wear the veil? And the answer was, that's not included or something like that. Mm -hmm. And what, has, what happens is they didn't address it either way. Yeah. They just didn't address it. So in so the, the absence... It wasn't removed... Means, means that it's still there, yeah. yeah. And this isn't a matter, you know, just to exercise our little theological talent here, this is not a matter of doctrine. Uh, you know, the Pope or, or some commission on the liturgy could issue a ruling tomorrow explicitly saying, no veils anymore, but men do have to wear them. You know, that, that's not doctrine. It can, and then next week, they can change it back. But, but we do have to follow these canonical rules uh, out of respect for the church. Uh, I would encourage every woman here uh, to consider doing that. Because why? Well, one thing, it does set you apart. It does tell people, yes, I'm a Catholic and I take it seriously. Uh, and, and it's a gorgeous thing on a lot of different levels. And there are many styles available. So you really want to make consider doing that. I can tell you that. It's mm -hmm. scary at first. They're long ones. They're short ones. Uh, so, um, you know, it's just part of the tradition. And, you know, as Catholics, you've got 2,000 years of tradition. You've got liturgy. You've got music. You've got theology. You've got literature. You've got visual arts. You, you've got it all. It's all yours. Every bit of it. 2,000 years worth. You'll never learn it all. You'll never exhaust it. Revel in it. Do it. Use it. Another it's fun. That got, a, 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 did, that got changed or people interpreted it as a change was, you know, and I grew up with this in public school. We always had fish on Friday mm -hmm. out of respect for the Catholics in, church, in, school, in public school who could not eat meat on Friday. Mm -hmm. And giving up the red meat on Friday is a, is a type of penance, mm -hmm. okay? And I think what they did was they said, okay, you don't have to do this penance, but if you don't give up the red meat on Friday, you still need to perform some <coughs> penance on Friday. And people gave up the meat, or they started eating the meat again on Friday, but they didn't pick up the They penance. didn't give up anything else. They yeah. didn't give up anything else. And I that is something that people don't realize, and every now and then Father McDonald touches on that, mm -hmm. and that's when things happen. Well, well, yeah, and I'll tell you all this, and, and this is, uh, I've, I have read this document, I have read it closely, I got a PhD, I'm a lawyer, I can read, I have read this document which were, was put forth 30 years ago by American bishops, I can't understand what the thing says, and it's a fairly short document, I can't figure out what they're trying to say. You have to deliberately work to make a document as obscure as that, okay? Um, uh, what, do, what do you get when you cross a lawyer with the Godfather? You get an offer you can't understand. All right, I couldn't understand that. I still can't understand it. And because I can't understand it, then prior practice continues. And that prior practice is every Friday of the year, we have to give up meat. Now, if you want to be a little bit more liberal about that, pick another penance. But every Friday of the year, you have as a Catholic to do some sort of penance. Pick one and stay with it. Nothing big. You know, you're not going to, 
you know, take a leather belt with spikes on it and give yourself a hundred lashes. Um, you know, this is not designed to harm you. Um, it's designed to make you uncomfortable and to put you in the mind that Friday is the day of your salvation. Um, and that it costs something. And it didn't cost you. <laughs> Um, it, you know, it's not supposed to be damaging, or, but, but it's, supposed to, it's supposed to twinge a little bit. So start tomorrow, folks. Um, and frankly, most of your fellow Catholics will not be doing it. Don't let that stop you. They don't know any better. You do. You teach them. During okay. Lent, it's really emphasized, and there's two yes. days during Lent that you actually perform a fast. Which days are those? Catechumens and Good Friday. Very good. Yeah, so, very good. And we'll remind you of that more. So, um, but, but good question.